Good morning. Good morning. So I'm not going to talk to you about wounds. <laughs> Although I have worked in wounds for some time. I worked in Smith & Nephew for 10 years in their wound management division. So I got used to uh, being in clinics and looking at wounds and I know some of the difficulties that you must all experience. What I am going to talk to you about though is change and um, Una did just touch on at the very end of her presentation the challenges that you're all facing and how in the systems doing some things differently um, will make a difference. So I'm hopefully going to give you some interesting things to think about. Um, I'm running a workshop later so for those of you that are interested in knowing a bit more you can come, you can come to the workshop. So lifting it up just a little bit, the, the NHS is never out of the news, so you all will know most of the stories that we hear are these kinds of stories, aren't they? They're the negative stories about the things that go wrong or the challenges that we face in the NHS. But we do amazing things every day, and most of you in this room, I'm sure, could tell lots of stories of the amazing things that you do every day. I'm going to position to you, I think, around you being the change agent, that change begins with the way that we all are with inside ourselves. And I'm going to give you some things to challenge your thinking and to open that um, conversation up. Peter Fudra, I don't know how many of you have ever come across his work, but he simply pulls in the change agent concept into three different areas. And those three areas being about the being different, seeing things differently, and also doing things differently. And in most of our organisations that we work in, um, particularly I think in, in the NHS more than some of the private sector organisations I've been in, we focus a lot around the doing. So the system improvement skills, you've probably all been on project management training and you know how to do change differently. But actually, if we're still doing the same things in the same way, if we're not looking at it differently or being slightly different, then it's never, it's never going to improve. It's almost, I can't remember, was it Rita Mae Brown who said insanity is doing the same thing over and over again? And that's a little bit about what we do in, in some of our organisations. So I'm saying really that change starts with all of us, that we need to be different to enable us to actually affect change. There are some things that get in the way though, um, and that's all linked to our backgrounds, our upbringings, the way that we think about things. But where every single one of us in this room is hardwired around system one and system two thinking. I don't know if you've come across this concept before, but when somebody asks us a question, your brain instantly goes to an answer. And that's your system one thinking. And nine times out of ten, that stands us in really good stead. You know, we ask the question, what time's your flight tonight? And you can instantly think about what time that is or what time's your train. But system two thinking, where you have to actually think about things a little bit deeper, that is more challenging. And we don't naturally do that. So when you've got more complicated things that you're going to work on, having the system one response, when you're sat in a team of people and you've got a challenge in front of you, most of us will use our system one thinking to try and solve that challenge rather than stepping back and trying to work out what the problem actually is. So I'm going to just test this out with you a little bit over the next few slides. So um, visual biases, how many people in the room would say that those lines are curvy. Put your hands up if you think they're curvy. Yeah, they're not, they're actually dead straight. But your brain interprets them because of the black and white that they're actually not straight. What about that one? Do you think they're straight or do you think they're hands up for straight? So most of you think they're not straight. They are actually still also straight lines. If you can actually measure them if you really want to. <laughs> if later, if people really still don't believe me, you can measure them. So our, our minds don't automatically tell us what's really going on. And this does become quite important when we're in environments where we might be in a team where we've got lots of different views and opinions going on. And we can be really sure of our opinion, but that doesn't mean to say that that opinion is right or the other person's is. It's just, it just is. So we could all have our own inbuilt biases. What about this? Can somebody tell me what that said? Yeah. So some said Paris in the spring, didn't they? And some said Paris in the, the spring. So again, your system one thinking. You'll read it, your brain understands it. It's Paris in the spring, that's what it is. 
but it isn't. It's Paris in the the spring. So slightly, just slightly different, but enough for you to think about. What about this? If a, a bat and ball costs one pound and ten pence, and the bat costs a pound more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? So I'll give you just a, a second <laughs> to think about it. System one versus system two. So any ideas about what the ball costs? Nobody dares say now, do you? <laughs> Five p. Any anybody else have a different view? Who said ten? Ten p. Ten p. So what what's going on? I'll tell you the answer in a second. But what what, what what's going on for you is this system one, system two thinking, and it hurts a little bit, doesn't it? That lack of quick response. It just you think, oh, I don't know. The right answer is five p. So, very well done. You don't get a Kindle paperweight for that, unfortunately. <laughs> Should have thought about that in, in, in advance. But you, I don't know, for those of you in the room, did you feel the difference between your System 1 and your System 2? You probably automatically thought 10p when it first came up. And then when you thought about it, you can, you can actually work it out. So, we have some biases that um, affect the way we think about things. Are we all still talking about the 5p or the 10p? <laughs> Do you want me to explain it? Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> if a bat and ball costs one pound ten p, and the bat costs a pound more than the ball, the ball can't be ten p, can it? Because then it would be one pound twenty. The ball is five p because the bat costs one whole pound more, and it was one pound. Yeah. It hurt my head for ages when I first did this. And even when I was putting it in, I was thinking, oh, it's that bat and ball thing. You're not there. No. So we can work this out later. This will go on forever. Whenever I do it, there are people that come up to me for hours and go, it's definitely 10p. So it, it isn't. It is 5p. But it does make your mind hurt, doesn't it? That got you all thinking, didn't it? Are we there? Do you want a couple of minutes to explain it to each other? No? No? Okay, so difference between system one and system two thinking. That's not all the biases that we have, though. We have lots of other biases as well. And on Wikipedia, they do a lovely visual of all the different biases that could affect us in our day-to-day -day worlds. It's massive. Um, but these are just some of the ones that I think are quite important. Some things like confirmation bias, where you interpret and search for information that matches what you believe to be true, might not necessarily be true. Or the hindsight bias, where you see past events as more predictable before that event occurred. And you can see there's, there's a number on here, a framing effect where, you know, you draw different conclusions from the same information. So if you went to the shops, would you buy something that said 15% fat or 85% fat free? And it, it has a, it, you think about it differently depending on how things are framed. So all of this is going on inside us. Whenever we're going to focus on a problem, a work-related or a home-related or just a problem in life, all these biases and decision-making things are going on. But so are our beliefs as well. So for most of you in the room, you're tissue experts, I guess, aren't you, and wound experts. So you will all have um, a high degree of knowledge in, in that area. And Mark Twain said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that isn't so, that just ain't so. And in a lot of cases, we can make leaps in our own mind that we know things, because it's happened that way in the past, is going to be that way going forward. And I, I guess I'm saying that might not be the case. And the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge from Stephen Hawking. So ignorance is fine, but our false beliefs are not so. And our beliefs might not be false, but it's just being aware enough to think that just because something happened in the past, or you think it's happened in a certain way, doesn't mean that that's necessarily the case. These are all really difficult concepts to get around, and we could do a whole day's session on some of the things I'm talking to you about. We've just got a very short period of time, so I'm just positioning them with you, really. So, we've got some biases, we've got some strong beliefs, they may be right, they may be wrong, <laughs> um, and we've got lots of problems that we're trying to solve in the jobs that we do. Uh, on top of that, 
there's a lot of research now that shows that we can really suffer psychological distress if we're not authentic and true to ourselves, true to our values, true to our beliefs, true to what matters to us. And, you know, that gets challenged on a, on a daily basis. At the beginning, I showed you some of the headlines um, that are in the media that are usually negative headlines, and it's really quite upsetting when you're working, doing the best for your patients, doing best, your best for the people that you work with, to read all of those negative things. It has an impact. And if it gets to a point where you don't think you can be that authentic with yourself anymore, you make decisions, and decisions could lead to leaving the service, Look at, the, look at the difficult challenges we've got nationally around nursing. Um, and I mean, we have doctor challenges too, but nursing challenges, I think, is such a massive issue for the NHS. And some of that is linked, I think, to people feeling they can't bring all of themselves to work, that the way they're expected to work, the lack of nursing in ward areas, in hospitals, or you know, the, the cuts that have happened in district nursing teams, all those things have a real impact on bringing all of yourself to work. So biases, beliefs, authenticity of how we can be, all of this is really, really challenging. And in the organisations that, that we work in, I'm going to just put to you that we focus, and I did say at the beginning that you'll have been on programme management courses, you'll have been on different sessions that allow you to learn some technical skills. So we focus a lot on content and process. Um, you know, results analysis, Una talked about data and data analysis. We'll work on methodologies, systems, structures, hierarchies. How many times have you been restructured in the organisations that you work in? But the bit that's missing, the missing piece of that jigsaw is the context that we're all working in. So the rest of my conversation is going to take that as a beginning uh, parameter, really, that being really aware of the context of the organisation that you're in. You can apply this at home, too. It's, it's not just a, a work-orientated. We tend to focus on the doing rather than the being. And focusing on the being is, if you think of System 1 and System 2 thinking, it's, it's more painful. It's harder. To do some of, the, some of the things I'm going to talk about, there's a section of core competencies that you need to develop. Some of the work that I'm talking to you about I would do over a three-day training programme, and in that three days we would go through some of these competencies that helps you to focus differently. So I'm going to begin, there's a, there's a five-step model um, that introduces you to some different concepts. The workshop that I'm doing later is going to focus in a deeper way on intentionality but it's not going to do the other four as I said this you could do this over over quite a few days so most of the time we focus when we're th talking about doing things better or improving on things we focus on stretch targets don't we or you know continuous improvement that would be another way of defining a, a stretch target or we talk about something completely different, which becomes a pipe dream. We're going to build a new hospital at the end of the M3. And it's going, you know, that means we'll only need one big hospital rather than three or four. It's ne probably ne that'll never happen. In between all of this, there's something that I would call break a breakthrough, which is a, a, it's an extraordinary result that isn't based on what, what the past would tell you could, could happen. So we've done a little bit in terms of thinking about our beliefs are based on what happens in the past. It's called conventional thinking. And conventional thinking helps you to decide what you're going to do next. Breakthroughs are much different to that. They're about having and developing a vision. Not an output, but a vision. Something you really want to be different. Something that really matters to you to be different. It's, it might be something that makes you come to work every day. It might be something that you really want that will make a really big difference to your patients, for example, but you can never get the funding for it or you're just not taken seriously. I mean, some of the breakthroughs in wounds and wound management over the last 10 years probably were and came from some of the breakthroughs. Some of what Una spoke about earlier, about this, you know, wanting to do the job that she's doing and people thought she was mad, that's linked to wanting to have a breakthrough result, something that's really going to make a difference. And usually when you do that, you make yourself feel really uncomfortable and you stand up and speak it publicly. So it's about being really intentional about something that matters to you, what gets you out of bed on a morning that would make a real difference. And it allows you to bring some of your authenticity that we talked about earlier and the values that are important to you back into the, back into the workplace. 
I will, I'm going to flick through the other elements just so that you know how it fits together, um, just so you get an overview of it. So the, the next bits for me would be about identity and that's about once you've developed that vision, once you've got that breakthrough and you know what you're going to actually stand for, that you work out who's going to help you to deliver that. It's really important. We can't change the world in a day. I don't think we put a man in the moon from one person saying, do you know what, I'll put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, which I think was NASA's um, a vision, wasn't it? Um, so, you, you know, whose day would be different as a result of the change you want to implement or who will help you to do that work? There, it's really important to think that through and to try and work with them so that you can develop and deliver it. The coffin that's at the bottom <laughs> is that um, one of the other things other than our biases and our beliefs that get in the way of being able to do things are things that you know we believe to be so. And if we do believe it to be so, that we make an assumption and it won't change. Once we've got an assumption, we're quite wedded to that. Um, and that you would class as one nail in a coffin and you can you can move yourself away from that. But if it hooks you more, if you've got evidence to support what you believe, and if actually you've got even more evidence to support it, once you get to three nails in a coffin, it's an awful phrase, isn't it? But three, three nails embedded into a piece of wood, um, then it's really almost impossible to unhook yourself. And being aware of that might help you with that vision. So if you think something can never be so, and you've got loads of evidence to support it can never be so, I'm saying that actually having that as a vision is probably unlikely to ever be achieved. You've also got to be quite sensible around it. And inclusion. So you're going to speak this vision publicly from the rooftops everywhere to anyone that will listen to what you've got to say. Um, but engaging all staff and helping them understand what it is that you're trying to achieve. I'm sure you experience this being done negatively yourselves. You'll be able to tell me, I would think, examples where um, that hasn't happened. So there might be a great vision, but you don't even know about it because nobody's talking to you about it. And the, the informatic that you've got here is just conventional thinking. The interpretation and the action is usually what leads us to what we're going to do next but working out the possibility, your vision, is really key to enable you to be able to achieve it. And interpretation and action will all be used to at work. So um, how often do you sit in a meeting with people that you can trust? Not the formal meetings where we tend to do our business in the way that we're supposed to do it, but when people have left the room and there's a couple of you sat there and you say, well, that's never going to happen, is it? You know, they say that, but, you know, and, and so your assumptions and your beliefs start to come into it. And that's your interpretation bit. You know, if you stood at the coffee machine and you'll say, oh, guess what they're doing now? It's those things colour the way that we are and, and what we do. And actions also do that. So, you know, if you get a, a presentation at work that says we need to chop 5% out of our budgets, everybody, um, then, you know, your, your inner story would say, well, we did that last year and that means we're not going to have the, you know, the right equipment to treat our patients and, and so on. So that's all well and good, but conventional thinking will not allow you to really develop a breakthrough. So to enable you to do it, you almost have to stand in the future. What is it that you're really wanting to achieve um, and develop that? It's not easy. This is really difficult stuff. <laughs> and then inspiration. So as I've, I've just said, standing in the future. And when you're talking to people, there will be really cynical people. Not everybody thinks, oh, yeah, great. Let's, that's what, I've wanted to do that for years. Let's go ahead and do that. You're having to almost sell something to people. Um, and that's really tough. And people don't necessarily want to know, but there's a way of doing that that isn't about personal conflict and can be much more around um, understanding what people's concerns are and helping them to come up with the solutions to those concerns. So um, I call that um, quick wins, really, and promises and requests. It's a whole te te piece of technology I'm not going to do today, but it gives you tools to enable you to deal with some of the cynics that are around that steal your energy and make you feel very tired when you get home at the end of the day. And then it's all about you. Um, again, using the conventional thinking, but allowing each other to move to a non-judgmental process where we're all trying to work towards what the right outcomes would be, what would make the biggest differences. So, um, as I've said, five steps, of which today all I'm focusing on is one step. You can see how much there is in this, but it's, it's really starting to 
get your mind to think that things might not necessarily be the way that you see them. So if you think in your organisations, if you think through if you were developing a vision, what is the organisations that you work in, what are they like, or even the systems if you're not actually, if you work more in the system than in the organisations, is it full of people that are commentating all the time, you know the, the conversation that I had about the coffee machine, is it full of people that are playing the game, that you know, know what the, what the, we're in a football stadium aren't we, so if Southampton are playing, the game today is with Southampton, but actually you're playing for Sheffield, they're not here. <laughs> So is that kind of thing going, going on? Or is it a very coaching environment because breakthroughs are, are very much around coaching? And just think about your own organisations and where they might be positioned around that. It starts with making a commitment does breakthrough thinking. So going right back to the beginning and thinking through what is it that matters that much to you? And it, there might be nothing for you individually, but there might be things for you as a team or things for you uh, in terms of your organisations or in terms of your systems that would make a real change to how things and the outcomes for things could be. But it all starts with making a commitment, taking bold action. So this doesn't come easily. It's quite difficult to stand up and be counted and say, this matters that much to me that I'm going to make a really big difference around it. So commitments are thinking through what matters that much to you. Personal commitment is at the beginning of this. So I don't know if anyone's ever come across Alicia Montana, but she was 34 weeks when she ran here. She's a multiple Olympian champion, and she came last, I think, in this race, which is probably... Uh, and if you go on YouTube, there's actually an interview of her as to why she did that and why, why it mattered that much to her. But she, her view was she's a runner. That's what she does for a living. And so while she was pregnant, she still ran. Um, and she still wanted to maintain her levels of fitness so that she could go back to being an Olympian champion once she'd had a child. Um, she's had two children now, and she carried on running up to 34, 35 weeks with both of them. I can't imagine <laughs> when I was pregnant <laughs> actually doing that. But her personal commitment, her desire to, for that, to, that was so important to her that she chose to do that. And I, I've given you on here uh, just one or two different examples. So Thomas Edison, um, he, get, he had 9,999 failures in when he was developing the light bulb. So I don't know how many of us in the room think that something's that important for us and we stand up to be counted for it and we might put a vision around it and then we hit a real block and it really destroys you, doesn't it? Or you think you're never going to be listened to or you can't make that much of a difference. So... Um, these people on here didn't do that. You know, the uh, Starbucks, 242 times. So this is real failure, isn't it? And Disneyland, I mean, we probably all know the story about Disney because he did get rejected so many times. And J.K. Rowling as well with Harry Potter. So lots of personal failures, but it mattered that much to them what they were trying to achieve that they, that they kept going. And um, just for me to finish, the quite a big number of famous failures. I know that you probably know some of the stories on here and I'm not going to read them all out. Steve Jobs, probably most of us do know the depression that he suffered when he was ousted from Apple and then obviously he came back, didn't he? Um, there's a number on there. So what that means is that breakthroughs really come from something that you're really passionate about but it means making personal commitments. So when you make a commitment, it might be a work-related commitment, but for it to really mean something, then it has to be personal. And that's where some of your authenticity comes in and some of the working to your own values and making sure that what matters to you, bearing in mind all these different biases, the wonderful individuals, unique people that we all are, with all of our different backgrounds and skills that we bring through, Nine times out of ten in our workplaces end up being quite cynical and, you know, the water cooler conversation or the corridor conversations of how it is around here, all that does is perpetuate how it is and to enable it to be different, you have to almost stand apart and do it a little bit differently. Okay. So, thank you. <laughs>